Good evening, Pastor John Davis of the Amityville Community Church. Father God, we do want to thank you for this day. We thank you because you are good, gracious, wonderful, blessed, magnificent God. Lord God, I, we, we just thank you. You're a, you're a father. It's Father's Day. What better way to honor our father than to close out our evening in our father's word, talking about our father's goodness and our father's grace, our father's mercy. So Father God, we ask you to inspire, to revive, to encourage us by the power of your word, through the grace of your Holy Spirit, the goodness of your beautiful son, Jesus, and bless this time in your word for your glory and the much needed good of a desperate people of yours in Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, good evening. I'm going to address a passage that you might find somewhat unusual in regards to prayer. We are going to talk about the goodness of God, the goodness of God the Father. We're going to speak about it, but we're going to look at a passage to lay some groundwork, as it were. Now, I want you to understand that Pastor John likes to take you into some passages of Scripture that might be overlooked, that might not be touched, that might not be really dwelt upon, but they're in the Bible. Bible. They're in the Bible for a reason. We have Genesis to Revelation, and every part of the Bi Bible is theologically important. It is doctrinally, uh, it is doctrinally profitable. The question is, do I see the prophet in it? And if I see the prophet, am I willing to preach it? So I want you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I believe we're going to have a good time in this. I realize that there are times when we have certain dreams and aspirations. We have hopes and ambitions, but we don't tell anybody about them. We don't tell people because we know that sometimes the people around us, they don't have these same hopes. They, they, and if they have it, they don't tell us. We are afraid of a, of a wet blanket. But I'm going to tell you something about God. God calls us to greatness. He calls us to extraordinary. He is a spectacular God, and he has spectacular promises for his people. I know we say that, but I hope we walk in it. As it says, he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's Romans 8.32, and we already know Romans 8.37 is, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors, so you know it could be a good night already in the word. It's already a good night. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Please, in this passage, what has just occurred, David has committed adultery and murder. He is uh, adultery with Bathsheba and killed Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. He has concocted a murderous plot. He has uh, instructed his general Joab to, to create a battle plan where Uriah would be killed. Now, this is definitely heinous. It is atrocious. It is, it is vulgar in the sight of God. But please do not miss an important and key lesson of how God addresses our brother David. Of how God addresses our brother David. How God addresses our brother David. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Come on now. So, so, so understand the goodness of God. Understand the goodness of God. One more time. Are you with me? You understand the goodness of God. God does not first tell David how horrible and wicked and vulgar he is. He's saying, look at how good I have been to you. I gave you a nation to rule. I gave you women. Oh, yes, I said women. Notice he said, I gave you your master's wives. And I'll throw out some theological confusion because it says earlier in the Pentateuch, do not let the kings multiply wives for themselves. Amen. Oh, yes. I like to throw it out because what I fear is we have a, a theological template we have a, a doctrinal paradigm, and when God doesn't do it the way we want, we can't preach on it. But I realize that 
after Isaiah told Hezekiah he was going to die, and the prophet can't be wrong according to Deuteronomy 18, but Isaiah said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. And then God said, no, Hezekiah, you're going to live. Isaiah, go tell him, I changed my mind. Does he say change his mind? No, you may call it what you want. He says, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Hezekiah prays. He gets 15 more years back to Nathan and David. Notice what God said to David. I'm going to preach it for you because I want you to go to bed tonight thinking about maybe when I wake up tomorrow morning for my prayer time, my prayers are going to be a little bit bigger, a little bit a little bit larger, a little bit, a little bit grander, that I'm not going to just pray according to how I have been praying. Maybe I need to expand my view of God's goodness since he gave his son, he who spared not his son. I'm not going to nickel and dime you. That's my Bronx paraphrase. Please notice, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have also, I also would have given you much more. Please let me tell you how others may translate this. David, why were you not content with what you had already? David, you should be thankful for what you have. You don't need to be looking at bigger and better things. I, I don't know. Why, what, who says what to whom? But I know what God is saying to David. And by the way, always remember this. Always remember this. God gave us, David didn't have, even have the down payment of the son yet. Amen. We have the course. We know the, the guarantee is the Holy Spirit, but I'm, I'm using some metaphorical illustration. He didn't even have the course yet. We have a better covenant. I also would have given you much more. Amen. Oh, come on with me. I ask you to come with me. Come on now. We, better yet, Pastor John, as a religious person, you hear of adultery and murder, you might first want to rebuke, chastise, correct, and reprove. God is going to do that, but the first thing God proclaims to David, please underline it, underscore it in your, in your biblical mind, use your, your mental highlighter. The first thing that God wants David to understand is that I'm a good God, and when you want something, why don't you think about coming to me first before you want to go take matters into your own hand? Why didn't you trust my goodness? Don't you see you're the ruler over Israel and Judah? I gave you your master's house. And yes, please notice the plural, master's wives. I'm going to let all of the others who are much more astute than me debate the theological truth of master's wives. But I'm here to tell you about the goodness of God. I'm here to tell you that God is telling David, you could come to me. You could come to me and you could come to me if you think you don't have enough. And if it hadn't been too little, if it had been too little, if you don't think you got enough, why don't you ask me for something more? Come on now. I know somebody wants to hear this. It may be two people, but I'm learning like a woman at a well. Sometimes you got a message just for one. Let me tell you something, folks, about Pastor John. I'm learning. Learning later in life, you try to preach to fit into somebody's evangelical approval box and you are going to have to answer to God. You, I have learned, I better preach what the Lord tells me to preach. So I'm looking at a passage and I'm looking at God talking to a king who has committed adultery and murder and he's disappointed He's somewhat disgruntled with the king, not only because of adultery and murder, we know that's coming, but he's disappointed, disgruntled, displeased because you doubted my grandeur and generosity in willing to bestow upon you so many blessings. I was going to get to Luke 11 and Matthew 7 about the father because it's a good father. He's a gracious father. We'll have to look at those later. 
In Matthew 11, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, according to Luke, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. But Matthew says, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things? Good things. You know what I like about good things? Your good thing and my good thing may not be the same. Amen. Many times we, we as preachers, come on now, as preachers, we want to tell everybody what their good thing is. But I don't know what your good thing is. And you don't know what my good thing is. But thank God he knows us. Because we're inscribed on the palm of his hands. So when I go to him in prayers, he knows what my good thing is. For some mother, it's it's not her health, it's the health of her child. For some father, it's not his success, it's the success of his child. So God knows what good things his people want. I'm learning as a preacher not to try to tell you what your good thing is. I know the Bible has good things already laid out for us. But I'm also knowing that David was a man with several wives and God is saying, you didn't have to resort to adultery and murder. If you just asked me, I would have given you much more. Wake up tomorrow morning. Energize for prayer. You might go pray differently tonight. You might pray with your spouse differently tonight. You might pray over your children differently tonight. You might pray for a change of life differently tonight. But all I'm going to tell you is, with God, the sky is the limit. Did I say the sky is the limit? Forgive Pastor John for, for, for misrepresenting God. I don't know the limit. I don't know if there's a limit. Glory to God. I don't know why I said the sky is the limit. Because he does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine. Passages that are quoted as doxologies in churches every Sunday. And yet we walk in total unbelief. When I when you anything I could, I'll give you much more. Doing exceedingly abundantly. And we always want to make it so distant spiritually. It's only in the cross. It's never in our house. It's never in our home. It's never in the lives of our children. I'm going to, you know, sometimes you hear some people say something. I, I want to, I'm going to say this. I want to preach this into your heart tonight. I want to preach this into your heart tonight. I'm going to say it again. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. I don't know what you've done in your life. I don't know. But I know at this point, God is talking to David. God is talking to a man who, who was guilty of adultery and murder and his, his, he is expressing great displeasure that you doubted my goodness. You did not trust in my generosity. Somehow you were not confident that the, the God who had given you so much already would not continue to pour out abundant blessing in your life. Oh no. Oh no. I got a book. And I, I'm going to use this word more and more. I think I'm going to stick to the script. I'm going to stick to the script. That might have to be a new channel. Stick to the script. Oh, yes. There are, there are gems tucked in this book. Gems that I have seen. But I want to, I, I've seen them. But I want to, I want to impart them to you now. Yes. I'm going to let those scholars. I'm going to let those who are much more heady than me figure this out but i'm thinking like it says in matthew look when a child comes to his father for an egg he slaps him an egg and god and jesus represents his father saying if your fathers are evil can do this how much more will my father in heaven i know it's paraphrased i know it's paraphrased but you understand look it up in in in, in matthew 7 and luke 11 but please do not miss this I gave you your master's house and your master's wives. So that already throws a little monkey wrench into the theological framework that many of us set up. Well, you know, God only gives according to his will. Well, I told you, you could look it up in Deuteronomy. Don't multiply wives for the king. Don't let them multiply wives. But he said, I gave you, I gave you your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Let's go to God and let's call him the God who gives him gives much more. Amen. I think that's a fair name for God. If he gave, if we really believe that Jesus is what we say he is, then let's say, I'm going to pray to the God who gives much more. 
You know what? Thank God for that phrase right there. And you know what's what's so clever about that phrase? I didn't come up with it. It's right there in the Bible. See, we don't preachers don't have to be clever. Just preach the book, and the book is clever enough. It's powerful enough. It's glorious enough. It's magnificent enough. The God who gives much more. If you're 79, if you're 83, you don't know what God is going to give you for the next 10 years. You don't know if God is going to give you another 35 years. We had a sister in our church today, 95 years old. I know when she was 75, she might not have been thinking about 95. So when we go to pray, let's go pray to the God who what? Gives much more. So let's not hold back asking God. Amen? Let's not. And do me a favor. If you, oh, please, I'm encouraging you. If you're encouraged, pass this on. But if you're not sure, don't go speak doubt into people's lives. Go into your closet. Work some things out with God first before you go to qualify and restrict the hope, restrict the, the, the mercy that God may be pouring out in somebody's life. You, you, you realize Jesus deals with his folks differently. Amen. You, you, you know, because you, you saw that woman caught in adultery and all at the end was, neither do I condemn you. No even discussion about it. No sit down council session. Everybody has to figure this out for themselves. Come on now. But I know what I'm reading. I know what I'm reading. And I know that that horizontal and that vertical piece of wood is supposed to remind me that God is more generous, more giving, more gracious than I could ever imagine. So now why am I hesitant in what I ask God for? Many of us have been taught, oh, come on, come on, come on. Glory to God. May God bless this word because he's a great father. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. First, of course, happy Father's Day for anybody who has God as their father. Happy Father's Day. But let us as men, as fathers, pass down to our children some faith, some gospel optimism, some gospel belief, some Holy Ghost certainty in the word of God that we're not hedging our bets. Come on now. Not hedging our bets on, on limiting, almost that we're embarrassed if God doesn't come through. Come on now. He's the God who gives much more in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.